You are renowned for being one of those pioneers because you championed the idea that it's actually our beliefs, not our DNA, that affects our, our biology. Absolutely. Uh, um, you know, it staggers my mind that it actually turned out that way because I was teaching in medical school, teaching about genetic control, all the things that people have learned that they're victims of their heredity. Uh, and what my research on stem cells revealed is that genes don't control anything. Rather than being victims of our heredity, uh, we now recognize we're masters of our genetic fate because we can change our beliefs, our environment, our mind, and those are the things that control our biology. So we're, we're masters of our genetic fate. Abs absolutely, and this is really such a turnaround because it's a revolution because everyone says, oh, oh, I, my family has a cancer gene and uh, I, I can get that cancer and now I'm very scared the rest of my life about the cancer. And the fact is, no, that's not really true at all. Genes don't cause cancer. Matter of fact, genes are only responsible for less than 1% of disease on this planet. So 99% of the illness on this planet is not because of a physical breakdown of the machine. Uh, uh, it's really due to what I call driver error. Uh, <laughs> and the relevance about it is when we believe the genes were controlling, then the genes were the driver of our lives. Yeah. But now we recognize the mind is controlling it. And if we had good programming, like good driver education, how to take care of our health and how to take care of our, our biology and the environment in which we live, then we recognize we are the ones that are controlling the outcome. So if you have bad driver education, bad care about your health, you will then break down the machine. And then we blame the machine yeah. uh, because we've always said, oh, the genes did that, but now we know it's our beliefs in our mind that are controlling the genes. So when you say less than 1% is caused by your genes, less than 1% of disease, what's causing disease? Actually, lifestyle, what it is, it's sort of like, as a, you know, let's say you get two cars off an assembly line, they're built exactly the same, and you give one to a hothead kid, teenager, and you give one to an adult, you know, more mature, mm -hmm. and then you let them go and you say, well, which, you know, come down the road later, which, which vehicle is healthier, which one's still on the road? Mm -hmm and you'll find that the hothead teenager car will be more likely to be in the junkyard faster yeah. than the other one. I said, well, what's the difference? I said, well, the, the body is a vehicle, and we are driving the vehicle. If you don't know how to drive in harmony with your biology, you don't have good driver skills, that causes a breakdown of the machine. And up to now, we've been blaming the breakdown as a consequence of a defect in the mechanism. Yeah. When in fact, no, uh, you're just inappropriately driving it. Okay, so how do you get to be a really good driver of your biology? Well, the first thing is to be aware that your thoughts and your beliefs and how you interact with the world are actually affecting your genetic expression. Yeah. And, and it's really this whole mind-body thing. And for years, conventional science, which I was a part of, really just poo-pooed the idea of mind-body. But now we recognize the, the real control comes from when you have a thought in your mind, your brain releases chemistry. Yeah. Okay. So uh, like emotions, for example, uh, if you have a thought of being in love, you can feel the, the wonderful glow yeah. and, the, and the chemistry because the brain is releasing chemicals that complement love. But if all of a sudden something shocks you or scares you, for that moment, you can feel the chemistry in your body change as you, you know, you can feel butterflies in the stomach or weird or, or, you know, some kind of tingly in your body when things aren't working right. I say, yeah, because when the brain uh, is in fear, it, it releases all different kinds of chemicals. So your body is responding to the chemistry of your thoughts. And most of us, and the issue is now clear, 90% uh, of the illnesses or the 90% or of the reasons why people go to a doctor uh, is now due to stress. Mm -hmm. And stress is like uh, driving your car with one foot on the brake and one on the gas. Yeah. You're going to break something. Yeah. Yes. So if, you, if your mind can control your biology, how do you change your thinking to be positive? Well, this is the biggest issue is because our, uh, we're very confused. When we say the mind, it's actually two parts. There's a conscious mind, which is connected to you as your personal identity, maybe the seat of your spirit, the yeah. conscious mind. Uh, it's creative. And there's the subconscious mind, which is 90% uh, is of the brain, but that's more habit. Yeah. And the issue about it is we believe that, oh, I'm running my life with my creative mind, which is the one with wishes and desires. So I say, Kath, tell me what you want out of your life. And if you give me, oh, I want to be healthy, I want to be in a great relationship, I want a great job, I go, that comes from creative thinking. 
conscious mind. Well, unfortunately, uh, science has now revealed that we are only using the conscious creative mind 5% of the time, and 95% of our, our biology is coming from subconscious programming, uh, and that programming came into our lives before we were seven. Right. The story I tell in lectures very quickly is I say, well, I'm sure you uh, were familiar with a friend when you were growing up. You knew your friend's behavior very, very well, and you happen to know your friend's parent. And one day you see your friend has the same behavior as their parent, <laughs> and you get all excited. You want to tell somebody, go, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. <gasps> and then you back away from Bill. Bill goes holy ballistic, says, how can uh, you compare me to my dad? And everyone laughs, and I go, well, it's a funny story. It's the most important story in the whole world because, number one, we are all Bill. Yeah. Meaning, Bill, everyone else can see that Bill is behaving like his dad. The only one who doesn't see it is Bill. And I say, well, how does that work? And the answer is because he downloaded the behavior from observing his father before seven. And then 95% of the day when his mind's thinking, he defaults to the behavior that he got from his father. So he's playing his father's behavior, but he's the one that doesn't see it. And the reason is why? Because the only reason he's playing it is he's not paying attention yeah. because he's thinking. So he's the only one that doesn't see he's doing this behavior. And I go, well, we're all Bill. And what it means is 95% of the day, we're operating from programs that we got before seven years of age, which came from other people, observing other people and downloading their behavior. Yeah. Uh, and then we worry about, well, how come my wishes and desires that I seek every day when I wake up and want to go forward in the world, I have a hard time getting there? And the answer is because 95% of the time you don't see, you're sabotaging yourself with behavior yeah. that will not support that destination. So suppose you wake up and you go, oh my goodness, I've turned into you know, my mom or my dad or whoever, and I can see that I'm doing it. Yes. How Isn't do that you, annoying? I know. <laughs> how, do you, how do you stop yourself from doing that? Well, the first thing is being coming consciously aware. As you said, yeah. oh, I observed myself doing it. Well, the subconscious mind is the habit mind. Yeah. Okay, so it's you learn a habit, and then when you repeat and repeat, it will just download the behavior. So guess what? Every time you observe yourself behaving like your mom, let's say, yeah. you say, oh, wait, stop. That's not what I want. And what you're going to do is you're going to change the direction of that thought. Yeah. Every time you catch yourself doing that, it's like learning from a repetition. Right. The, and after a number of times of doing that, the mind will not automatically play that behavior because it already knows the moment you play it, you're gonna wanna change that behavior. So it acquires a new habit. The yeah. new habit is before playing that behavior, it will redirect itself to whatever the, the new program you were looking for. Right, so in the same way that you can start a new habit, which is not behaving like your mum or yeah. your mom, yeah. as you say, um, you can also do the same and impact your health. In, in every level, and this is the most important thing, as I said, we have been programmed to believe that when we have an ill health problem, a dis-ease, yeah. we've been programmed to believe that we're victims of a machine going out of control. Yeah. And now we have to turn that whole thing around and say, wait, I am in control of this machine. Yes. And that I can change it at any time if I become conscious of it. Uh, and it's very interesting because, as I said, on a regular day-to-day -day life, 95% of the day we're operating from programs that we got from other people. Uh, and, and then I say, there's one time in your life where you actually don't do that. Uh, and I say, well, when is that? And I say, when you fall deeply in love with somebody. Aww. That's the beginning you know, <laughs> called the honeymoon. And I say, well, what's unique about the honeymoon? Well, recognize this. When people fall in love like that, number one, they become very healthy. But, you know, we always say, oh, look, they're in love. See how they glow. <laughs> you look great. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, exactly. And it's like, well, why? Because the mind in love releases chemistry that supports health. Yeah. That's why love encourages health and love heals, okay? Yeah. And, and what we also find out is that when people fall in love, that's the one time that they stay mindful. They don't start thinking a lot. And I said, well, what happens then? Well, if you're not thinking, then your conscious mind is the one that's controlling. And I said, yeah, but that's the one with wishes and desires. So I say, so what happens when two people fall in love and at that moment stop playing the programs that have been limiting? Yeah. Okay? They both are now playing wishes and desires together. I said, well, what manifests from that? And the answer is heaven on earth. That's what the honeymoon is all about. Yeah. A and, and all of a sudden I say, well, look, no matter how crummy your life was up until the moment you met this person, boom, your life changes. And I go, what's different? You stop playing the negative programs that were playing invisibly yeah. and sabotaging you. And so the first time in your life, you're operating without the program. And guess what you created? Heaven on earth. So how do you stay in love? Because people, that honeymoon phase, <laughs> and actually it's in your book right here, The Honeymoon Effect. Yeah. It, it's a short phase sometimes. Well, it's a short phase, but there's very logical reason. The answer is this. 
when I first fall in love, I stay mindful because that person that comes into my life, I, why should I let my mind wander when my whole life I was looking for this person? This person shows up. Uh, and it's like, well, why should I let my mind wander? They're right here. So we keep our mind present, and that's why we stay conscious and we're not defaulting. But then, regardless, life is still going on even if you fall in love. You still have a job. Yeah. You have chores. you got things, to, bills to pay, things to do. And why I say, why is that relevant? Because the moment that those things start crowding in on your mind is the moment you default back to the old behavior. And remember, that subconscious behavior that you got from other people did not play during the honeymoon because you were playing from wishes and desires. Yeah. But now you're starting to think of something and your partner you've had this great love with comes up and asks you a loving question and you're in thought and all of a sudden you go blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then your partner looks at you and goes, who are you? What kind of behavior is that? Uh, and then you have to recognize, just like Bill, I played my father's behavior because my mind was thinking about the chores, right? But I didn't see what I just said because it was default behavior. So now my partner is saying, what kind of behavior is that? And I'm trying to think, what's she talking about? <laughs> Why? I didn't see what I just said. So all of a sudden, guess what? That's the beginning of the breakdown of the honeymoon because now all these behaviors that never played in the honeymoon that are negative yeah. kinds of behaviors that we got from family and programming they start showing up in a relationship, and guess what? That honeymoon, which was built on you being conscious, is being lost as the subconscious starts to provide more of the progress. So in summary, one final tip for living a blissful honeymoon-based life that is full of health and vitality. What's your one tip? Things I have trouble obtaining in my life, I have to recognize that I must have belief programs that sabotage getting to that end. And therefore, I said, oh, well, then I know what beliefs I want to change. I just look at my life and say, wherever the hardship is, yeah. uh, that's a reflection of a belief. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Bruce. I so appreciate it. And I really want to thank you, and I want to thank the audience for their attention. Thank, thank you. you.